it's always fascinating to hear of projects that projects and initiatives that manage to avoid that kind of parachuting in thing where you pop in, do something, pop out again, and nothing's really changed. And it sounds like this isn't that. It sounds like it's really had um, a deeper kind of resonance than that. Uh, maybe if I ask the first question, why do you think it is that it's achieved that? What, what do you think you know, has been within the, the development of the, you know, the creation of, of, of everyone that's, that's actually made that happen? Um, I think the key thing has been that um, this has been a little portion of time that organisations have um, had to focus on disability equality when otherwise um, they might have had a lot of other, other priorities and day-to-day -day life might have got in the way. So this is something that has really allowed them to have some thinking space around it and that has meant that it has been embedded in the work that they've been doing on an ongoing basis, I think. So maybe the fact that there was a number of different projects happening and they were kind of working simultaneously rather than just one mm. project in one mm. place at one time with nobody else to talk to. Yeah, certainly. I think um, I think the collaborative element has also been very important. Um, I think being able to work together in clusters um, and also work with the other four, um, well, across the four organisations has made a real difference too. Because I think there's been a lot of shared learning um, and a lot of looking after each other, looking out for each other, and. Um, knowing that they're all in it together and I think that's been very encouraging for the organisations as well. Just talking about how, you know, from the results that have come through, it seems that things are shifting, things are changing and we're just looking at what's, what's made that, you know, why was this project distinct in being able to make that happen? I don't know if you have any thoughts. Um, I guess, yeah, I'd echo what Ruth was saying about that sort of um, group dynamic of, of a group or cluster of organisations working together. Um, I think the way that we framed the project around um, organisations having to make quite sort of practical changes to their disability equality plans as well as working um, perhaps with a group of disabled people, I think that was very important. We needed to create a project that would start to make changes within the way that organisations worked rather than just funding some participatory activity. Um, so it was very important that that was embedded within the project. There was a training element, there was support offered, um, Ruth's support as the evaluator was offered to those organisations. So it was kind of a package of support rather than, as I say, just a grant to go and do some, some activity. So, so very clearly planned from the outset to have that uh, it, it that was business. yes yeah kind of forensically planned by uh, by Mary Taylor who was the project coordinator and I think what was very useful for us was that um, Engage had run this project in England and Wales called Explore um, which was a large project and worked with quite a range of galleries and organizations um, across those countries and so it, it was great for us to be able to pick up the evaluation report and look at that and say so this this <coughs> could work this didn't work so well and we could kind of refine it based on that and then come up with something that was appropriate for um, working in Scotland which which hopefully is, is what we were able to do and I think the other thing to say is that it still feels you know this is still obviously work in progress and things change and um, it, you can't just say tick this is it done this is the best way to do this um, and that's not what we want to say I think Right. Okay, open to questions. Anyone want something there? Yeah. We have this opportunity to ask now about the project. So anything you didn't understand, anything you'd like more information on? Uh, yes, gentlemen there, I believe we have a mic flying its way to you. Um, when we were doing our four questions at the beginning, we struggled with the first one. We were good on the second one, and on the third one, which was about diversity on boards, teams, and organizations and audiences, we really found that the teams, the boards, didn't actually embrace diversity in quite that way. And I wonder how the whole project has affected boards, teams, and the organizations 
that you've been working with and whether you see a direct impact on the constitution of um, the teams that are working in galleries. Okay, so, so simply rewriting the policy is one thing, but how do we actually get that to cascade down into making a difference in diversifying <coughs> the teams, the boards, the people who support that activity and the people who deliver it? Um, I, yeah, I don't know yet. Um, I guess we might have to ask some of the representatives who are here from those organisations um, if they're kind of thinking of making, making any changes to their boards at all. I don't know if there's... I'm looking out into the audience to see you all, but um, I don't know if anybody's got a comment. Caitlin from the Fruit Market. Um, hi, um, Caitlin Page from the Fruit Market Gallery. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's one of the first things that we identified as being really important for us to do was to um, make sure that our board reflected um, the sort of the focus on equalities that came out as part of this project. So um, it's something that we started discussing with our board. I think it's going to come out of a a sort of another process of kind of benchmarking what other organisations are doing in terms of equalities and I guess it's still um, a challenge for us and sort of one of the things that I wanted to get out of today was sort of looking at our project which we were so intensively involved in but how can our, all of our programmes, not just learning, you know, learning programmes are already, as we know, leaps and bounds ahead in the equality agenda but how can the whole organisation sort of embrace, really embrace accessibility and equality for all. So. We, um, yeah, definitely we want to diversify our board and have somebody with more specific um, expertise and equalities on it, but that's going to be sort of a longer term project sort of the next sort of year, two years time. So I suppose, yes, absolutely, it just may take time for those processes to, to roll out and for that change to occur. I know certainly for myself, you know, working in that equalities field, there's that sense of frustration about how long do some of these things take? But I certainly think in terms of diversifying boards, that is often quite um, you know, a one or two year process um, uh, to make that happen. Any other questions? Yes. I almost said Fiddler there from before. <laughs> Hello, Fiddler. Um, in relation to the last question, actually, and it's around those long-term measures of success, is are there plans, and I don't know whether I misheard, but are there plans to do a long-term evaluation in terms of two and five years, in terms of whether we see these legacies actually sustained within that time? Because actually that's the real measure of the success of the project, not just the immediate measures, and I didn't know whether there were any plans for that. Um, there are, I guess I'd say there aren't concrete plans, but it's something that in terms of the way that our projects work that you kind of we know the people in those galleries and so we sort of have this ongoing relationship which I suppose is the quite valuable thing about our network at Engage and so we can kind of continue to keep an eye on it in terms of then having some good concrete um, data then no and I guess that's something that actually now we've got to this point we should think about how we go back in a couple of years or you know a year's time and, and measure it um, because sometimes you get really nice anecdotal evidence of people I've been to a gallery and somebody kind of waved this leaflet at me going look we're still doing it we're still doing it from the project we did three years ago that's yeah it's great so you just need to find a way of capturing that and, and measuring it and making it useful for everybody else I suppose so that was a long way to say uh, yes hopefully so. I think that's our first recommendation of rising from today is that, yeah, when we get funding to run those kind of projects, it all tends to be tied up in that final report, you know, and it's, it can be quite hard to hold on to the money that's required to do those longitudinal evaluations. But you're absolutely right, without them, how do we test the sustainability of work? How do we actually measure that impact? It's got to be over at least six months a year, three years. So I suppose it's about planning it into the continuing development of the organisation if it can't be within the funding pocket held by that particular uh, programme. But absolutely good, we're getting a recommendation out there, very early for a recommendation on a day like today. Uh, a question there. I'm just really interested in the networks um, that you researched. And you said you um, found 2,108 networks. And I'm just wondering, what do you mean by networks? Were they informal? Were they more sort of formally recognised? Yeah. Obviously, you sort of focus more on organisations, which is fair enough. But I'm just wondering about artist networks as well. And did, is that sort of included in that figure? Um, did you look at that at all? Uh, yeah, certainly. That's um, 
That's a great question. Um, uh, the various organisations um, that took part in the project, I suppose, defined, uh, defined that in their own way, um, but they were asked to uh, let us know um, the extent of the new networks that we that they had created and we kind of added it all together. Um, so from my understanding, that, um, that varied. Um, for some of the organisations, um, that was um, linking up with um, other organisations in, in the community. Um, I believe um, that the Dundee project, for example, linked with various different local um, charitable organisations. Um, for some of them, it was making links with individuals, and I think that might have included artists in the case of Peter Potter Gallery, perhaps. Um, so it, it, really, it really did vary from um, individuals to um, different um, organisations, I suppose. So it might have been about becoming part of existing networks as well sure. as establishing new ones. That's true. Because it is a startling, startling number. Yeah. Question at the back or comment? I was on the steering group. I was just um, referring back to what Joe raised earlier this morning about areas of discomfort. Were there er any areas of discomfort for, for projects, for the project, particular cases where there was something came up as a challenge and people learnt? Uh, from that, I was just interested in from the research if, there, if any of that stuff came up to the front so that we can take away some learning. Okay, so what was difficult, what was uncomfortable? I, I, yeah, I'm going to hand that over to the projects actually. <laughs> so. Hi there, um, I'm Zoe Fothergill from the Talbot Rice Gallery uh, and we were working with uh, BSL audiences and there was a real question for us about uh, whether that was just for deaf people or it was also for hearing people too or for people who were learning BSL, uh, interpreters and so forth and so um, there was a pinch point at one point where that became a real issue actually and um, we really seriously had to kind of think it through and I guess uh, essentially we're coming down to the uh, opinion that mixed audiences is, is the most interesting way to go but in some ways perhaps the most challenging because you've got to meet lots of people's needs in that kind of context so yeah any other project want to talk about being uncomfortable <laughs> Juliana Capes and I worked with the Peter Potter gallery and the resident in Sanderson's wind um, and I was just saying to my table when we were talking that I think I spent three quarters of the project feeling desperately uncomfortable um, and in hot water it was a very challenging <laughs> project but I think that, um, that that was very good for the project in a lot of respects that you don't really learn anything if you're in your comfort zone and it wasn't a project that was figured out before it started um, but I think the, the uncomfortable and challenges of the project came from um, twin, the twin needs of needing to be extremely flexible in order to work with the kind of groups that we were working with, but also working within the constraints and timeframes of a project. Um, so flexibility within constraints is an interesting um, place to be. Um, so I think that's where my uncomfortable situation came from. Okay, fantastic. And one at the back as well. So Derek from Dundee Contemporary Arts. Um, our project was based around having artists in residence in our building to specifically challenge and hopefully make us feel a bit uncomfortable. But we had two feelings of uncomfortableness, if you like. Uh, one, before we actually managed to get the project up and running, at DCA were quite, um, quite lucky in that we've got an established staff team. We have been working on disability equalities for a long time. Uh, but there's always uncomfortableness and feeling around uh, the lack of what we're doing and how we tackle individual needs versus organisational need, shifting activity from education and access into sort of central embeddedness within the organisational culture. Um, so our project, in a way, tackled uncomfortableness by uh, giving us a route into uh, challenges. So um, you'll probably hear more about that later on in other subjects, but there was uncomfortableness before we even started the project, so that was good. Okay, fantastic. I know that, that we, we need to, to kind of stop there, unless anyone's got anything really burning that they really want to, 
to kind of say about everyone at this point. Nobody's combusting with, uh, with desire at this point. Hopefully, maybe by this afternoon. Um, but we're going to uh, just stop that there. First of all, can I just thank both uh, Sarah and Ruth for, for being up here and contributing uh, well for that. And also, fantastic questions. Question about uncomfortableness. I like it.